So here are my disclosures, just to let everyone know. Virtual Koi 2022 had over 3,000 attendees from 86 different countries. About 40% were from countries outside, other than the United States. So it was truly an international conference. Uh, at this conference, there were over 1,500 accepted abstracts and about 38 accepted what's called late breakers, uh, hot off the press of information. The acceptance rate, meaning how many, what percent of the submitted abstracts were accepted was about 57% and about a little over half of the late breakers. Just to kind of give you an idea of the culling process that occurs every year with CROI. So here are the two viruses, HIV and SARS-CoV-2 that were discussed primarily at this conference because it is now both an HIV and COVID SARS-CoV-2 <clears throat> conference. So let me talk, start off with the what I consider to be the top stories, the top line information that really came out of CROI 2022. <clears throat> the first bit of information in terms of the big picture of what's going on with the global pandemic of HIV AIDS is that over 79 million people have acquired HIV since the beginning of this pandemic. 36 million people have died of AIDS and about and over 37 million people are currently living with HIV around the world. In the year 2020, the year for which the uh, World Health Organization, the UN AIDS has the most complete data, there were 1.5 million new HIV infections, which has been a, unfortunately a pretty, a pretty uh, consistent number that has happened for the past several years, probably the last 10 years. However, the number of persons dying from AIDS has decreased to under a million now at uh, 680,000 age-related deaths in 2020. Globally, about 74% of adults and 54% of children with HIV are taking antiretroviral therapy. However, over 27% still do not have access to ART. The new 2030 UN AIDS targets have been shifted upwards from 90, 90, 90 to 95, 95, 95, which means as many of you probably already know, 95% of people know that they know their HIV status, 95% of persons are in care, and 95% of people are undetectable on antiretroviral therapy. Another statistic for you guys on Palm Springs that may be of interest to you, it is predicted by the CDC of the United States that by 2030, in just eight more years, 70% of the persons living with HIV in the United States will be over the age of 50. Excuse me, Dr. Hardy, I hate to interrupt, but uh, we've lost your picture. Are you still uh, screen sharing? I am still screen sharing. Oh, shoot. Let me see if I can close. This is some... Dakota, we still have the picture. You do. So... We don't hear in the theater for some reason. Oh, really? Damn okay, man. go ahead and continue and I'll work with the, uh, the, the guys here to... Uh... Okay. So go ahead and continue, sorry about that. Let's see what my internet connection's like. Hold on one second. Well, the um, people in the Zoom audience say they have it, so. But you don't have it in the, but it's not, it's not projecting? Yeah. Yeah, I have Zoom up on my computer, so. Uh... It, it's coming in, but not. Oh. How about is it coming coming through now? No, it's not for some reason. I'll work with the um, the AV guys here. So go ahead and continue. Damn it! Sorry. No worries. It's not on your end. It's on ours. So. Uh... All right, let me get back to where I was and reproject the slides again. So in terms of the, the big picture with, uh, with COVID-19, what's happening in terms of the other pandemic that's been going on 
not nearly as long as HIV, Rochelle Walensky, um, who is the CDC director since um, our new president has taken office, stated that 53% of the world's population is now vaccinated against COVID-19, but only 8% of Africans. We know that about 65% of persons in the U.S. have been vaccinated. So we're not too much more than the world's population, even though the vaccines were oftentimes created in our country. It's also noted that 60,000 public health jobs have been lost in the last 10 years. Dr. Walensky brought this up to really point out why some of these, some of this problem probably occurred in the first place, because the um, preparation for pandemics uh, was really underfunded, and questions still remain of how well this pandemic could have been averted. The good news, though, is that the CDC has spent over 6.4 billion in new hires at the community level, epidemiologists, labs, and data collection and management. So there are some good things that are happening uh, in terms of public health because of COVID as well, retroactively. Let me move on now to really talk about kind of what the CDC put out there. In about four years ago, the CDC posted some, presented some information with the National HIV Surveillance System, which, which indicated, put, put, put out some lifetime predictions of how, how, what the chances of different individuals at risk for HIV, what their chances of becoming HIV positive after the age of 25. So their lifetime risk of HIV uh, acquisition. At that time, you might remember that one in two African-American men were predicted to have a, a one in two or 50% chance of becoming HIV positive throughout their lifetime. For, for Latino, Hispanic gay men, that number was about one in 10. So based upon some of those predictions, they redid their calculations and updated it to 2017 and 2019. Overall, the lifetime risk for US residents has decreased by about 11% from one in 106 to one in 120. You'll see in the table there to the left about how some of these have changed. For males overall, it's about one in 76. For females, about one in a little over 300. When we break that down by race, race and ethnicity, we see that, that black men still have the highest risk of becoming HIV positive throughout their lifetime at one in 27. And also for women who are African-American or black, one in 75. And you can read down those columns there and to see that persons of color, particularly black, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, Native Hawaiian, other PIs, other Pacific Islanders, and Native Americans and Alaskans have the highest risks of for both men and women. You see that persons who are Caucasian or white and Asian have the lower levels. The lifetime risk there does, as the graph shows there on the right, increase dramatically um, up to about at the age of 50, then it tends to level off as you can see on that graph as well, which is also good news. Across the country, different states, persons who live in different states have different lifetime risks of becoming HIV positive. As you can see in California, we are about exactly where the, the country is uh, at one in 120, at one in 121. New York is a little higher than us, one in one, uh, 108. And my former home, in Washington, D.C., still remains the high point jurisdiction at one in 39 persons becoming, may become positive for HIV. Was this like skewed to the left or skewed to the left? So I just, I looked on this back screen because that's where you can see the cursor. And so I just dragged it by the top bar over to the right a little bit more. Okay, so how do I do that now? Um, well, okay, uh, I should be here, please. Oh, yes. so let's Go see. ahead, Dr. Hardy. I think. Gotcha. So we just kind of look and see the highest risk remains 
in the south and southeast between over, Texas over, all the way up to over, Maryland and D.C. and see. also New York, New Jersey. Your cursor and interesting also in Nevada. To the right of this screen. Just so you to kind of show what the, the, right? what the um, what? transmission risks are throughout the United States. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Uh, so what was, what was important here was that there were significant decreases in lifetime risk acquisition for women uh, who were native, native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, black, which is great news, down 56%, Asian and Latina. For men, it was down significantly for black men and also for white men. Somewhat decrease for mm -hmm. American Indian, Alaska Native women, down about 9%, and also Native, Ameri native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, Asian and Latino men were going down too. However, it was increased for Native American, American Indian, Alaska Native men about 10%, and interestingly for white women as well. The conclusion from this is that overall, the big picture is showing that prevention is working, that the highest impacted groups of individuals, particularly black men and black women, and, and women and men of, of color, the, the proportion, the chances of becoming HIV positive over their lifetime is decreasing. So prevention, both by PrEP and also by treatment as prevention is working, which is great to see. The other big story that you may have heard about that came out of Croy this year was a report of a new cure for HIV. Um, and this time, interestingly, in a woman, not a man. <clears throat> this was presented as part of a, a federally sponsored study from the NIH called IMPACT P1107. <clears throat> IMPACT is the um, treatment network that primarily focuses on maternal, pediatric, and adult, excuse me, pediatric and adolescent um, treatment <clears throat> for HIV. A researcher, a pediatric researcher, who I've known for many years, over 30 years at UCLA named Yvonne Bryson presented this case. Just to give a quick background, there have been two previous cures of HIV that many of you are, are, are already familiar with, both um, the uh, formerly called Berlin patient, Timothy Ray Brown, who unfortunately succumbed to a recurrence of his leukemia in 2020, but was first cured of HIV in 2009. And also the London patient, Adam Castillejo, who was cured in 2019. Both of these individuals were given stem cell transplants from primarily for, some, for a cancer. In Timothy's case, it was acute myelogenous leukemia. In Adam's case, it was Hodgkin's lymphoma, neither one of which were responding to chemotherapy. Both individuals underwent stem cell transplants. Chemo Timothy actually went through it twice. They received high dose chemotherapy to wipe out their own existing and cancer filled bone marrow and other immune system, and then received adult donors, adult donor stem cells from a particular kind of person who, whose genes were lacking uh, in what's called the CCR5. They had a, what's called the Delta 32 mutation in the CCR5 gene, which makes their cells uninfectable by the most common type of HIV called CCR5 tropic HIV. They both had graft versus host disease, which means that what happened was that the new immune cells rejected the person who received them, the patient's body. And during this time, it was thought that that was an important part of clearing the HIV infected cells. Timothy remained HIV Uninf uninfected for over 12 years and was deemed cured. And so far, Adam has remained un un uninfected for 30 months and also deemed cure as well. So why have there only been two cases out of all the ones that have been tried? Because there, there have been attempts in at least probably 12 to 13 other persons with cancer to be cured with this kind of approach. And, most, and those other cases have not worked. One of the problems is that the special kind of stem cells and the donors from which they come, those persons who have what's called Delta 32 uh, CCR5 deletions in their cells, 
are very, very rare, less than 1% of humans on, on the earth. This, this mutation in humans is found primarily in Northern Europe, but there is no routine screening of bone marrow uh, donors, bone marrow or donors. And this is where the idea about cord blood banks as a potential solution came up and why Dr. Bryson from UCLA thought about this, because the blood from umbilical cords after they are cut from the baby and, from, and pulled from the mother's placenta, from the placenta inside the mother's uterus <coughs> are drained of blood and that blood is put into a bank. Most of the time that umbilical cord blood has been used for children's um, use um, because it's only a small amount of blood. Now, when an, there is like in the two previous cases, adult unrelated donor grafts, the advantage of that is that there's lots of cells that can be done, that can be taken from those adults. And that causes rapid engraftment or the fact that the, the donated or new stem cells go back into the bone marrow very quickly because if engraftment doesn't occur, then the person's high, at high risk of death because they have no immune system. However, the disadvantage of that is that there has to be very close matching of the bone marrow and, and stem cells from the donor to the recipient um, because there's a big risk of what's called graft versus host, meaning that the new immune system may reject the person's body. On the other hand, umbilical cord blood grafts have the advantage of already being banked. They are readily available for screening and require less less um, stringent HLA or matching between the donor and the recipient. Because in a baby's, in a, in a newborn baby's blood, the, um, the cells the, inside, the, um, inside the umbilical cord blood are not mature like adult cells are. And they do not have nearly as many of the, what's called HLA, mat, HLA proteins on the outside of them that identify them as coming from a particular kind of genetic um, background. And therefore, they're more able to be compatible with a, a, a recipient and have less potential rejection because of that and the lower risk of the graft versus host disease. The disadvantage is, is that there's not many cells in, a, in, in an umbilical cord. This can lead to delay in engraftment and sometimes the person can get sick and die before the engraftment ever occurs. So what they did in this particular kind of study is they combine these two. They combine haploidentical, meaning that the genes were similar. <clears throat> um, they combined identical cord grafts. They took several of these banked umbilical cord blood donations and put them all together. And they combine that with some adult cells taken from this particular patient's sister and use them together to have enough cells and cells that would engraft rapidly. So this study called the IMPACT P1107 study was observational that we're just trying this out. They had actually done it in only one other person. There was both cord blood and cells from uh, a, an adult. And this was something that actually had been, been pioneered by a company called StemSight, who's been doing this and has been maintaining a bank of over 300 cord blood units that have been screened and made available in this, in this blood bank. This is, this is stemming out of a collaboration between the NIH um, group called IMPACT and also the International Blood and, and Marrow Transplant Research Center and endorsed by the ACTG, the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, which Jeff can tell you all about. So let's get to the case report. Again, like I mentioned, this was a woman of mixed race. <clears throat> we don't know too much more about her because of her confidentiality. She was diagnosed with HIV in 2013. In 2017, four years later, she developed acute myelogenous leukemia, blood cancer, and she received three partially matched um, Delta 32 mutation cord units from stem site, the blood bank that holds these. She also got um, some cells from her sister, which were, were a five out of eight match. 
as well. So as you got kind of a mixed situation, this was done in New York City and it was done at Weill Cornell Medical Center. So here's kind of the, her course over time. Starting there on the left side, the blue line represents all the way across what her HIV viral load was like. <clears throat> so initially with her HIV diagnosis, she had a very high viral load of over 10 million. Um, she got on medication, it came down. And then when she had her induction chemotherapy in order to be able to prepare her for the stem cell transplant, you can see that the viral load shot up because oftentimes the induction chemotherapy disrupts the immune system and causes the uh, medication to no longer work so well. She then got the transplant there at time zero and down there at the bottom of the of the graph. And all this time she remained on her antiretroviral therapy. She stayed on her medications for HIV. She was discharged rather rapidly, only 100 days after she had the transplant, which is, in, which how, is- How come you didn't knock? Which is incredibly fast. Oh, it's okay, sure, yeah, yeah, I'm, okay, hold on. Post-transplant, she was doing well, as you can see, her viral load remained undetectable, but of course, remember she stayed on her antiretroviral therapy after the bone marrow transplant was, was given. And then at about 36 months, there down at the bottom, post-transplant, a decision was made after fully informing her of the risks and benefits of stopping her antiretroviral therapy. She under, underwent what's called an ATI, or an analytic treatment interruption, meaning her antiretroviral therapy was stopped. And so far, she has lived 37 months, actually 38 now, because this was reported over a month ago, <clears throat> and has been undetectable, less than 20 copies since that time. Mm -hmm. She's getting very close to the point where we can actually call this a cure, a third cure. There's been some very careful investigations <clears throat> looking for HIV throughout her body, looking for HIV DNA, which is found inside of blood cells. And you can see that in the red dot there to the very far left under pre-transplant, that they could find HIV DNA post-transplant They've all been below the limit of detection, that red dotted line there, all the way across up to a year after her transplant, a year after she stopped her medication, I should say. They've looked for what's called two LTR DNA circles, which are, are um, uh, ways of being able to, to detect whether or not the virus is replicating because the two LTR circles are something that results after the virus re re reproduces itself. And you can see in the blue square, which is positive at first, but it's gone negative because all those blue squares have remained open except for one time. You see there 14 weeks after she went off of the medication, but only one time did that ever become positive. And the other thing is, is her plasma HIV and the purple triangles has has two purple uh, diamonds has also remained undetectable. And the other interesting thing there are those kind of orangish yellow triangles, which represent what's called the replication competent reservoir. Many of you have probably heard about the latent reservoirs being the barrier to curing HIV. And it was detectable there for the transplant, but you can see that the attempts to, de to detect the reservoir or the latent cells in her body have not been very um, uh, uh, successful, especially those three times after she stopped her medications. So it looks like that by using the best ways to try to find HIV, in fact, latent or sleeping HIV in her body, it has not been found. The other thing interesting that was also seen in the first two cures, persons who were cured, uh, is the factor is that her HIV antibody test went from positive there on the left side with all those little bands, those dark lines, to negative over time. After, 40, after 55 weeks, over a year, you can see that there are no longer any bands showing antibody against HIV, meaning that her immune system is no longer producing antibody against the virus because as best we can tell, the virus isn't there. 
So if she was now tested with an HIV test, she would also she would not only have a negative viral load, undetectable viral load, I should say, but also a negative HIV antibody test, as if she was never positive ever before. So what is it, what is important about this in conclusion? This is the first woman and first US woman of mixed race who was successfully transplanted using this new technique of using both um, umbilical cord blood mixed with adult cells. She's been in remission now for her, for her leukemia for over four and a half years. She's been off of antiretroviral therapy for about 16 months now. And it's also been documented that she does not having the antiretroviral medication in her blood that sometimes could have happened surreptitiously. She has no detectable replication, uh, no de detectable uh, latent virus after oh, almost 75 million T cells were an an analyzed. And she's also found to have no cellular immune responses, no, anti no recognition of HIV by her new immune system, which is great. The thing that's really curious and different about this, as I mentioned, in the first two cases of cure, the graft versus host disease, the new immune system rejecting the patient's body was thought to play a role in being able to eradicate all the HIV that may have been left in the, in the person's body after the chemotherapy. In this case, this person, this woman never had any graft versus host. So it seems like that, that actually that may not be part of what an HIV cure requires. And move on. The other big news that came out of the conference I want to highlight at the first here were the results of the anchor study. Many of you may already be aware of what the anchor study is. Basically, it was it is a clinical trial that has been going on for several years to see whether or not identifying um, high grade or high risk lesions in the anus that can turn into cancer. It was the question that this study was asking is that when those high-risk lesions are found, is it better to observe them or is it better to ablate them, basically to destroy them by using a laser or a infrared, basically a heat device to destroy those cells? Just to look at kind of what the, what the rate of, of anal cancer has been like over the past 20 plus years, you can see that both in women in the pink and men in the blue, the rate of anal cancer has been rising over this time. Some of this is due to the fact that oral sex has become much more common than it was before. And the virus is spread not only from oral, but also but vaginal and oral vaginal and oral anal contact. Um, this is the, the rates of who was at highest risk for anal cancer. You can see there on the far left um, a, a panel of this graph that men who have sex with men who are HIV positive have the highest risk of having anal cancer that actually increase as age increases. The highest risk there are men who have sex with men who are HIV positive over the age of 60. Those risks decrease over time as younger people, but still remains elevated. And only in HIV positive men, less than 30 is the risk the same as in HIV negative men who have sex with men, but is still elevated oftentimes than compared to other individuals. Non-MSM who are HIV positive or HIV negative, again, HIV positive, older individuals have a higher risk. And you see among females, HIV positive women are more at risk for anal cancer than HIV negative women and also other gynecologic cancers, primarily cervical cancer, et cetera, and vaginal cancer. And then also in some non-HIV persons who have immune suppression, there's also an increased risk as well, particularly in females. So the real important, and the group that was primarily enrolled, that was enrolled in this study were HIV positive persons who might be at risk for anal cancer. This is the way we broke down. The anchor study enrolled persons living with HIV who were at least 35 years old. They had a, a, a what's called a, um, uh, uh, a, both a pap smear, but then more importantly, they had a, 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 an anal, an, an anoscopy that where they could actually look at the um, uh, lining of the, of, the, of the anus very, very carefully. 
If there was no high risk lesions found called HSIL or HSIL, they were taken out. They could not be enrolled in the study. If they found them, then they were, were enrolled and randomized in the study. If cancer was found, it was treated. So the, the randomization was either an active monitoring arm that every three to six months, those lesions were looked at and basically seeing what happened to them, or they were randomized to the treatment arm so that they were treated right away. If any cancer was found, that was considered to be the end point of the study and patients were taken out of the study and were treated. If no cancer was found, they remained in the study and the arms to which they were initially randomized to be in, either active monitoring or treatment. The basic results of this seven year study went from 2014 to 2021 was that 52%, there were actually over 10,000 people who were screened and about 4,446 were randomized. So about 60%, uh, 52% had, had, had uh, high grade uh, lesions that could lead to cancer in 53% of the men, 42% of the women, and 62% of transgender individuals. In this study, basically what happened was this, that um, the breakdown is shown there, 80% um, men, 16% women, 13% transgender individuals who were in the study, 32% white, 42% African-American, 16% Latino, so it was representing the um, uh, diversity of HIV positive persons in the US. Almost 70%, almost 80% homosexual persons, 23% heterosexual, and 7% injection drug users, <clears throat> and just over 80% were undetectable on their antiretroviral medications. Um, on the study, 93% have what's called electrical cautery, where a elect elect electrical current is used to destroy the um, abnormal looking cells and about 6% had a heat treatment. <clears throat> so here's the outcome. Here's what happened over a median or average time of over two years. There were 30 new cancers diagnosed among these individuals. Nine were found in the treatment group. 21 were found in the observational monitoring group. And this demonstrated a 57% reduction in having cancer. So if they were treated, the cancers did not occur nearly as quickly or as often. If they were just monitored, they did. And this study was really the, it has really become now the bottom line that says in high-risk persons in whom high-risk lesions are found, particularly HIV positive persons who have the highest risk of developing anal cancer, if a high-risk lesion is found, it needs to be treated, not observed. And this study has actually proven that very, very nicely. And we expect all the guidelines around this to be changed very quickly because of this. Now let's move on to some HIV treatment studies. We know that, that there's both first line and switch studies that have gone on for quite some time now. And the important thing here is to really look at the durability. There was an abstract that looked at the um, uh, two large treatment trials that were called 1489 and 1490 that were done by Gilead. They have been uh, carried out now for over five years uh, and have demonstrated basically that the combination of TAF, FTC, Bictegravir called Bictarvi is, is really not different and similar to um, um, the combination of using uh, Descovi or Abacavir plus uh, Dodetegravir or Tivacade. The two integration inhibitors performed pretty much exactly the same. Over 90, at, 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 at three years, 97% of people had a viral load less than 50. And if they were taking out the persons who actually had failure, almost 70% at three years still had any detectable virus. So that's really nice to see. I'm sorry, that, that would actually, uh, out to as long as five years, because they actually switched people over after the, for the last two years. There's also a study called the Tango study, a study which is actually pioneering the, the evaluation of a two drug um, switch treatment, um, comparing Dolutegravir 3TC, also, also known as Dovato, to um, TAF regimens. And what they found here was that between 80 to 86% of individuals remained with undetectable virus, less than 40, for three years, showing that two drugs 
do I take it for 3TC are just as good as a TAF regimen over a three year period of time. And the final thing here is about injectable medications. The Atlas 2M study was a study that compared giving the two new injectable medications, cabotegravir and rilpivirine, known as Cabanuva as a group now, either giving it every four weeks or monthly, or giving it every eight weeks or every two months. And now three years out into that study, it showed that over 85% of the individuals have become, or remain undetectable. And this is uh, irregardless of whether they got the medication every monthly or every two months, really indicating that the injectable medications uh, are working, they're maintaining very high levels of suppression and doesn't make a difference whether you give it monthly or every two months. That's a quick look at that. I'm gonna just go over these two studies kind of quickly because they were done in what's called resource limited countries, meaning outside the United States. This one, for example, was done in Sub-Saharan Africa and Zambia called the Vicen study. And basically what it did is it took persons who were failing their first regimen, their first treatment for HIV. They were sort of slightly failing it because their viral load was greater than 50, but less than a thousand. And those persons who were on uh, tenofovir or 3TC um, and either a Favrins or Nivirapine were randomized to switch over to dolutegravir and do that with either tenofovir or do it with TAF. So that was a switch for them. The persons who were really failing in arm B, whose viral loads were high, over a thousand, they got switched to one of those two medications of dolutegravir plus TAF or tenofovir, or they got a boosted protease inhibitor, either Kaletra or Rayataz. And the outcome of this study basically showed this, that number one, it didn't matter whether or not they got tenofovir or TAF with dolutegravir. Both medications worked very well out through a year. And the arm B, the persons that had a higher viral load when they were failing, it did matter what they got. And whether they got TAF or tenofovir plus dolutegravir was always better than getting one of the boosted protease inhibitors, be it Kaletra in the red bar there, or be it the uh, Rayataz information. And this, and this really showed that the, that the differences uh, were not pronounced between whether someone got dolutegravir with TAF or with just regular uh, Truvada, no difference there. Um, but if they got um, uh, dolutegravir versus either Kaletra or Rayataz, it did make a difference because the persons did not do as well with the boosted protease inhibitors. The next study called the uh, Anadia study also took persons who were um, failing their first regimen, which was uh, uh, either nevirapine um, uh, or Sestiva. And it was paired with uh, tenofovir and 3TC. Um, and basically what this study showed was that there was a lot of resistance these people had on their genotypes. 50% had the tenofovir mutation called K65R. Almost 90% had the... Uh, had the um, 3TC or FTC mutation called M184V. And the, both the genotype, the GT, and the phenotype, the PT, actually agreed very nicely there. What they found in this, in this study is that these persons coming off of tenofovir, the usual um, recommendation is to switch um, most of their drugs in their three drug regimen that they were on to different drugs. For example, the NNRTI was switched either to dolutegravir or to a boosted PI, to darunavir. Um, and the, and the, one of the drugs that were also on the tenofovir was switched to the AZT. That's what the World Health Organization recommends, is that you switch as many of the drugs as you can. But what they did here is they switched some of them from the tenofovir to AZT, but they also kept some of them on tenofovir even though they knew that there was resistance to it. And they switched everyone off of the efavirenz or nevirapine to the boosted darunavir. What they found basically is what it was that it didn't matter if you switched them onto AZT or kept them on the tenofovir, they both did 
One's when one was 92%, less than 400, one was 90%. Didn't make a difference. Nor did it make a difference whether or not they got the boosted darunavir or the dolutegravir. So basically what this is saying is that there are options that one can use and still come out with good results. That was at the one year, at the two year, the same kind of results were seen. I'm not gonna go into, re, into detail about, about this, but just take it from me that at the CROI conference, the new information from this Nadia study was what was seen at the one year or 48 week analysis was also seen at the two year. Meaning basically that you didn't have to switch persons off of tenofovir, you could keep them on rather than switch them to AZT. And it didn't matter whether you used um, dolitegravir or the boosted darunavir. They both work equally well. Now, there was a study that some of you may have remembered that was done called ACTG 5324. It was called the InMind study, I-N-M-I-N-D, because this was a study that was looking at what can we do about persons that are developing HIV dementia, not the persons who have already have dementia, but persons who are starting to trend in that direction. And this was a study which basically gave people who were, who were doing well on their antiretroviral medications, their viral load was undetectable, but when they were given what's called psychoneuropsych testing, it was found that they were starting to have early symptoms and signs of memory loss, decrease, decreased concentration, or early signs of HIV effects on the brain. The median age of these, of these 191 persons was 53, 71% were men, over half were black, 36% were white, and 22% were Latino. They found that 35% had what's called asymptomatic and neurocognitive impairment. They had early signs of dementia, that unless you really tested the person, you couldn't find it. 56% had mild and 9% had dementia. So what the study did is they kept the people on the medication they were already, they were already taking, and they added either one drug, dolutegravir, by itself, or they added two drugs, dolutegravir plus maraviroc, Tifica plus Celzentri, or they added two placebos. And they reevaluated the individuals at six months, one year, 18 months, and two years. What they did is they basically repeated the neuropsychological test to see whether or not they improved. Well, the good news was is that in all three groups, whether they got one new drug, two new drugs, or no new drugs, all of their neuropsychiatric scores increased, improved over the time. It didn't matter what sex they were, what, what race, where they were being studied, whether they had other drugs like efavirenz, et cetera. It's very common when persons take these neuropsychiatric tests that their performance on the test improves because there's a, there's a learning part of, to this. But what this study did not show was that adding additional anti-HIV drugs that are thought to help pen, that penetrate into the brain better um, did not make a difference. It did find, however, that a lot of persons in the study were depressed. They had high scores on the Beck depression inventory scale. And the other good news was is that the depression scores all came down in all the persons in the study. So whether or not this was effective just being in a study or, or what was hard, hard to know. But unfortunately, we did not find a, a uh, answer for how to treat uh, dementia or early stages of it for HIV. Adding more drugs does not help. How about prevention? There were new studies, new information about PrEP and also about vaccination. Many of you may have already heard about what the study called HPTN 083. This was a study that was, that was set up to, to compare using daily Truvada which is the first licensed medication for PrEP in the United States and around the world, or every two month injections with cabotegravir. This was a very large international study. It was done exclusively in men who have sex with men and transgender women who have sex with men. 
Um, 4,500 persons were in, enrolled. The great majority of them, two thirds were youngsters, less than the age of 30. 12% were transgender women, which was a remarkable enrollment. And 50% were African-American of those who enrolled in the US. They gave five weeks of oral cavitegravir first as a lead in, and then started giving every two month injections in the buttocks or the persons were randomized to get the daily Truvada pill. The study was stopped early because there was an imbalance as to how many new HIV infections were occurring, how many were, how many of the PrEP were preventing, I should say. There were over this, the study, at the time the study was stopped, only 13 new infections were seen in the cavitegravir arm versus three times that many in the Truvada arm, 39. <coughs> They also showed that there was um, uh, some differences in terms of the uh, uh, what's called injection site reactions, more common with the people who got CAB than who got the placebo. But only 2% of the people who had the injection site reactions, the ISRs, stopped the study because of them. So here's what it looks like over the three years the study uh, was going on. You can see the cavitegravir arm there in the orange color basically stayed pretty small in terms of how many new HIV infections were occurring over this over two year period of time total versus the blue dotted line of the Truvada arm, which showed that there was a very different, about a 66% decreased chance of becoming HIV positive if you got the cavitegravir injection every two months versus taking the everyday Truvada. In this case, cabotegravir was not just as good as, but was in fact better, was superior to Truvada. There were, of the 13 persons of the men and transgender women who became positive, they broke it down to see why did they become positive. And this graph, kind of this figure really shows kind of what this was. There were two people who got infected before they even started the study, before they even got their first injection. So they were already infected to begin with and they could have been screened out of the study, but were, but were not. The next five people were individuals <coughs> who got infected after they had stopped the cabotegravir for at least six months. And this was again, something that became pretty clear that it, when you don't get the medication, it doesn't work. There were also three people who got infected during that five week oral lead-in while they were taking oral medication before they got any injections. But the five people, I'm sorry, the three, three people got it before they got their injections, but the three, but the five people there at the bottom, the D1 to D5 individuals, got all of their injections pretty much on time, maybe a little bit late, but they yet they still became positive for HIV. And these were the five individuals out of approximately over 2,000 people who got the cabotegravir that were making people scratch their head and said, well, if they got all the injections as they were supposed to, why did they become HIV positive? And so the other kind of thing that happened here is that they kept getting the injections of cabotegravir even though they were HIV infected. And of course that created resistance in all five patients to the integrase inhibitor that they were receiving. And this is never a good thing because it makes it particularly more, potentially more difficult to treat those persons with integrase inhibitors down the road. What has occurred because of this study? I'll first of all tell you that in December of last year, late last year, uh, cabotegravir was approved as a new treatment, excuse me, as a new preventative for HIV by given every, six, every uh, two months as a intramuscular injection. So what was presented at CROI this year was what happened after the study was stopped. When the study was stopped, all the people who were in the Truvada arm were given the opportunity to switch over to the cavitegravir arm. And the first year after that occurred, what happened? Well, there were approximately um, uh, 42 new infections that occurred, 11 in the previous cabotegravir arm, 31 in the previous uh, Truvada arm, when they did, did a analysis on this, it showed that the, that the um, 
analysis still showed superiority of the cabotegravir over the tenofovir. Um, but they also showed that during this unblinded period when everyone was getting the cabotegravir injections, there were still 11 new, un, new infections. One occurred in, in a person that was getting their injections on time, three because of the fact that the persons who had delayed their injections by over six months, and seven um, because they had not taken any cabotegravir, I'm sorry, for over six months as well. So what they were kind of looking at was why this happened. Well, a big reason was because of adherence. We know that during the study, the adherence to the Truvada was oftentimes not very good because in order to be able to say that adherence to Truvada is good, it has to be at least 700 um, what's called fentamoles per, per punch of, 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 um, of a dry, dried blood spot. So only 73% had good adherence. That adherence dropped to 59% in the, in the year after the unblinding. So adherence, adherence, adherence remains a very important part of this, both for the pills, but also for taking the medication. The graph, the figure on the right shows that during the first unblinded part of the study, 91.5% of persons who were given cabotegravir got their injections on time, but that 91% decreased to just under 80% in that year afterwards. So people over time, um, do stop getting injections or taking pills. And that's a major problem. So what they did in those seven people who became HIV positive, despite the fact they were getting their injections on a regular basis, is they did a special, uh, very, very sensitive HIV viral load test called a single genome sequencing test, which can detect very, very, very low levels down to about one copy of virus to having an HIV of one, in other words, having a viral load of one, in other words. And when they were able to do this and find virus, they wanted to see when did this occur? Because when, what they were using in this study was not viral load test to see if someone was becoming positive. They were using an antigen antibody test, a regular fourth generation antigen antibody test, which they used routinely to see if people are becoming positive. But what they found was that in these seven people who got all their injections and still became positive was that the HIV test became positive very early on, but the an antibody antigen test was delayed at becoming positive. And the problem with this was the fact that when you use and rely upon a fourth generation antibody antigen test, you may miss some HIV infections that occur uh, that you would have got, been able to pick up had you done a viral load test. And what they found by doing this very sensitive viral load test was that they could have averted resistance had a test been used to be able to detect the virus, not just the antibody. I'm gonna go on now to the consequences to the update from this. Many of you may have known that the CDC has, has revised its HIV testing recommendations for persons who are taking or who are going, who are being screened for PrEP. The CDC now recommends, and these just came out again at the end of last year, December of 2021, is recommended that HIV testing is now part of the routine screening for HIV infection during and as a part of the screening test for both oral, meaning Truvada or Descovy, and injectable long-acting cabotegravir. For the oral prep, the test is done every three months as it always has been. For the long-acting injectable, it's done every two months because that's the interval that people are coming in to get their injections. So if the patient has ever received any oral prep or even PEP post-exposure prophylaxis in the past three months, or has ever received an, a cabotegravir injection in the past month, then what is recommended now is not only to send an HIV antibody antigen test called a fourth generation test, but also send an HIV RNA assay, a viral load test, because this will help differentiate if someone is in the process of seroconversion, because probably what happened was in those five cases in the cabotegravir study is that those persons were in fact HIV infected, they became infected, 
but the cabotegravir was somehow stopping or delaying the seroconversion of the antibody being, being able to be detected for several weeks, if not months. And so rather than draw a test that is not very good at being able to find early HIV infection, like an antigen antibody test, what the CDC now says is always the, do the antigen antibody test, but also do an, a viral load test now as well, both for screening and for ongoing monitoring for PrEP. The last thing I'll talk about is the companion study for HPTN083, the men's and transgender women's cavitegravir PrEP study. There was also a, a exact identical study done in women called HPTN084. That study was even more dramatic in comparison every two month injections of cavitegravir versus daily Truvada. That study showed a 90% decrease in, in a 90% benefit of using cavitegravir versus using Truvada. And it was actually very uh, much better, highly superior of showing cavitegravir was better over Truvada. However, one thing that was presented at the conference here was that there were 49 pregnancies that occurred during the study. Um, and here's the breakdown. 27 occurred in women receiving CAB, 20 and 18 occurred in women receiving, receiving Truvada. The outcome there was that there were some, there was some pregnancy loss, as you can see, less than 20 weeks. Um, and between 20 and 36 weeks, it was not really different between the two arms of the study. And of the 43 individuals of women um, with confirmed pregnancy and at least one injection, the incidence of adverse events did not differ between women who were pregnant or women who were not pregnant. The what's called the half-life, meaning how long the cabotegravir stayed in the pregnant woman, in the woman's body, was not different between women who were pregnant and women who were not pregnant meaning that the cabotegravir worked despite the fact the person, the woman was pregnant, which is good news because sometimes in pregnancy, the way that a person's body, the woman's body handles uh, medication changes and that can be a problem. In this case, at least in the 43 participants in this study who did become pregnant, there was no change and there was no increased side effects. So although this is not enough to say that cabotegravir is safe in pregnancy, it is at least early data saying that it may, might be. Now I'm gonna move on just to kind of quick, quick review of HIV vaccines. Many of you may already be aware of this, but as you can see, of these five large vaccine studies that have been done around the world um, <clears throat> since the early 2000s through uh, uh, 2021, and I'll tell you about this last one there, um, there's been either no effect, stopped early because it didn't work, and in only one study called the RV144 study, was there a slight decrease in protection from HIV with a vaccine. The study that was reported at, um, at CROI called the Imbodoko study was the study done entirely in women in Sub-Saharan Africa, over 2,600 women, it was, a, it was a vaccine that was sort of a two-stage vaccine and it was specifically uh, created for the type of virus called the clade C HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. And as you can see there on the figure to the right, those two different squiggly lines, the placebo in the blue and the vaccine in the red, that the number of new HIV infections did not differ between those women who got a vaccine with the placebo versus those who got the real two-stage vaccine. Unfortunately, this was yet another failure of the HIV vaccine attempts. Some new drugs for treatment and prevention. I'll just tell you briefly, many of you may have heard about this new drug called Islatravir, used to be called MK8591, being developed by a company called Merck. It works by two different ways. It is what's called an NRTTI, a, um, a nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor and trans, both an inhibitor and translocation <clears throat> terminator. So it works in two different ways like, around the same HIV enzyme called reverse transcriptase. It's very potent. 
uh, in, in test tube studies, and it also works uh, against many resistant viruses. The company Merck is, because it has a very, very long half-life or, or hang time in a person's body, it's being studied as a daily, a weekly, and a monthly treatment or prevention. And it shows here how long, how well it works in terms of knocking down HIV viral load in those two highest doses of 10 milligrams in the blue and 30 milligrams in the purple, you can say that you can see that one dose knocked down HIV viral load by almost two logs, almost a hundred fold by 10 days. So it is a very potent medication. In this study that was using this latrovir on a monthly basis in, um, in, in persons who were at low risk of getting HIV infection, they compared 60 milligrams of his latrovir to 120 milligrams of his latrovir given monthly versus placebo. And they did many, many studies to see how well it worked. The bottom line was is that both of them were, were um, worked very well. They stayed in the person's body for a, a long period of time at levels that should prevent HIV infection. Of note, none of the people in this study, because they were low risk, became positive. But it showed that the use of a, a one monthly pill could actually be for, produce enough medication in a person's body to be able to prevent HIV. What this was, what we learned about this study, about this drug further um, at Croy was the fact that there was no significant metabolic, meaning weight gain or body changes or kidney or liver changes associated with this, which is actually very good news because if you're giving a long acting medication, you want to be sure that it doesn't have long acting side effects. And so far, this looked like it was actually very good. So it was Latavir studies, as I mentioned, currently being done as an oral daily treatment with another drug called Duravirine, an NNRTI, a weekly, an oral weekly prevention treat and treatment, one with a new drug called MK805-8507, and also with lenacapavir, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then it's also being um, uh, developed as a long acting injectable for treatment with lenacapavir. And also finally, as a yearly implant, an implant of the zlatavir uh, being pushed in just beneath the, uh, uh, the skin and the subcutaneous tissue of a person's arm for a once a year prevention. <clears throat> However, what was discovered and reported at, at, at um, Croy was that in the treatment study of oral weekly as latrovir and the second drug called MK8507, lymphopenia or decreased lymphocytes and particularly decreased CD4 positive T cells was being seen. It was also being seen in the monthly PrEP study associated with using as latrovir too. And that caused concerns. There were no other um, blood cells that were being affected, white blood cells, red blood cells, or platelets. There were no signals in, the, in any of the earlier phase one and phase two studies. This was just in the phase two, phase three, in which larger numbers of people were being, were being uh, treated. There are multiple reasons I think this might be happening, but because of this, the bottom line so far is that the FDA has placed a clinical hold on these studies of oral injectable and, and implantable is latrovir and oral doravirine plus is latrovir. So basically this drug has been put on hold until further information and other safety studies can be done to figure out why CD4 cells are going down in these individuals. The last <clears throat> new medication I'll talk about is called linacapavir. It's what's called a capsid inhibitor. And it works at three different, at least three different places in the HIV life cycle. Shown there in red in this figure is nuclear transport, meaning as the virus is pulled into the cell and the contents of the virus, basically it's um, RNA and then DNA is taken into the nucleus of the cell for integration. And also during uh, capsid assembly when the virus is budding out of the cell as well. Uh, Linacapavir is a very potent medication, only takes a very tiny amount of it to be very effective. It works against all types of HIV, subtypes of HIV and uh, many resistant variants as well. 
has a very long half-life or hang time of 30 to 43 days, which is amazing. And it's available in both oral and subcutaneous injectable formulations. When it was studied in phase one, it was shown to drop viral load at, with one dose, one subcutaneous dose, it dropped the viral load um, as over two logs, over a hundred fold by a single dose of medication. So great, great potency. Um, the phase two, phase three studies have shown that again, a single dose of subcutaneous medication can last as long as 26 weeks. 26 weeks, the medication is still detectable in the person's blood. So really, really long acting medication. Two studies have been done with lenacapavir, one in treatment naive people, people who are just starting medication for the first time in this early phase two study. Lenacapavir was given as a three dose oral lead in over two weeks. And then the person's got their first subcutaneous dose um, on day 15 of the study. That subcutaneous dose was then also given with um, an oral medication. FTC was given with Discovy um, in groups one and two of this study. And then after 28 weeks, if their viral load remained undetectable, um, they, they were then continued on a two drug regimen of daily TAF, TAF by itself without the FTC, just half of the Discovy, but every six month injections. Or in group two, the oral TAF was changed to just big Tigravir by itself. The group three patients in this, in this study got oral linacapavir, no injectable, just oral and also oral daily Discovy. And then the fourth treatment arm was what's called the um, standard of care or the control arm of giving Victarvi every day. <clears throat> the results of this study actually look pretty good. Over the 54 weeks of the study, the proportion of people of these naive, new to treatment individuals of being undetectable was somewhere between 85 to 92%. And they really didn't differ very much showing that these, these, these strategies for using oral and injectable uh, medication do in fact work. Here's the breakdown based upon the arms they were in at one year. Um, as you can see, the diversity of patients in this, uh, participants in this study was good, 54% black, 45% Latinx, and although not so many women, but it shows that this strat these strategies are workable strategies and will go on to what's called phase three larger studies to actually look at them more carefully over time. The Capella study was also a study that uh, has been has, has used linacapavir, but this time not in treatment naive, people new, new to treatment for HIV, but in those who have been through many different treatments have what's called multi-drug resistant HIV, lots of resistance in their HIV. And now they're being given linacapavir with other medications in order to see whether or not this highly resistant virus can be suppressed. So what happened in this study <coughs> was that they used what I like to call a quick and dirty way of doing this and use the least number, enroll the least number of patients to try to get the greatest amount of results very quickly. What they found in this study was that compared to a placebo, a, a, a oral lead-in use of linacapavir given on days one, two, and eight, three doses would, could drop the viral load by almost two logs, 1.93 logs, which was very different than the persons who got placebo. And this was the major thing that showed that the linacapavir could work against the resistant virus. When they continued to carry this out for a longer period of time at Croy, what we saw was that even out to 52 weeks, the proportion of patients whose viral load was remaining undetectable was 83% for less than 50, 86% less than 200, which really showed that the linacapavir could in fact work along with other medications added um, to keep a highly resistant virus under control. The concern, however, that popped up in this study and also popped up in the previous study I just showed you was some resistance. There were four individuals in the Capella study 
who developed resistance to lenacapavir, shown there. There were two of patients in the, in the Calibrate study that developed resistance as well. So it looks like that while lenacapavir is a very effective drug, resistance to it can develop over time. The other, however, good news is that when we look at lenacapavir compared to other drugs that work um, uh, as entry inhibitors, be it um, trogarzo or ibilizumab or fostemzivir, I can't remember its other name, um, or maraviroc or selzentri, that viruses that are resistant to these medications remain susceptible to lenacapavir, which is great news because these drugs are ones that people oftentimes are on, especially the fostemzivir um, and the, and the um, ibilizumab, um, trogarzo. So there's partners that can be given with this, with this medication. Now, one of the things I mentioned at the very beginning is that two large drug companies made a uh, announcement last spring that they were gonna work together combining each of their own long-acting medications is Latrovir from Merck and Lenacapavir from Gilead. And one of the good bits of news here that was reported at this conference is that whenever you combine two drugs together, you gotta be concerned about what's called a drug-to-drug -drug interaction, how one drug may actually affect the metabolism or excretion of the other drug. The good news here that was reported is that there was no drug interaction on Islatravir from lenacapavir, and also vice versa, no effect on lenacapavir from um, Islatravir, which is great news that these two drugs can be given safely together in different kinds of combinations. The bit of a concerning news, however, was is that Gilead was about to get lenacapavir licensed by the FDA, approved for uh, uh, marketing. They, the FDA had granted them a priority review, but the, at the end of last year, December of 20, 20, December 21st, the um, drug was placed on um, clinical hold because there were some concerns about the fact that the glass vials, the borosilicate glass vials, um, was re were reacting with the lenacapavir in a way that might be unsafe. So the drug company has to come up with a new way of being able to package the drug. We hope the, that anticipate that will be done very quickly and the drug will be back out again. I'm gonna just wrap up quickly with some of the other, other information that came out of, of CROI. Uh, and that was the COVID-19 treatment side. We know that there are very clear NIH COVID treatment guidelines that have come out in 2022 now. There are four drugs which are available to treat early COVID. They are what's called Paxlovid, the uh, drug made by Pfizer. So, so Trovimab, which is an, a monoclonal antibody made by um, Veer and GS and GlaxoSmithKline. Remdesivir, which is the first one that came out uh, over a year and a half ago from Gilead. And Molnupiravir, which is the, the company, uh, the drug uh, made by Merck. At Croy, what we saw was that Sotrovimab could be given, and it has, can be given in more than one way. Primarily, it is given by intravenous infusion, which means you got to start an IV line on someone and infuse the medication over about an hour to an hour and a half, which of course takes time and requires a higher level of medical, ex, of medical expertise. So in order to see whether this drug could be given by a simple uh, mus intramuscular injection, they did a study in which they gave um, half of the people um, injectable sotrovimab either at 250 milligrams, which unfortunately was discontinued because it was too low, but the 500 milligram dose of sotrovimab given as intramuscular injection turned out to be just as good in treating COVID as the intravenous, which now makes this drug easier to give on an outpatient basis. All right. All right. The other a drug that was talked about there was one from Merck called Molnupiravir, uh, which is a drug that works, it's an oral medication. It works in a kind of interesting way of causing mutations in the virus 
so that the virus becomes um, weaker and stops uh, reproducing itself. The study that was done in primarily in the United, in, in outside the United, United States, but somewhat in the United States showed a 30% um, decrease in hospitalizations of persons who had developed COVID. Good, but not great. And this drug right now is uh, really only recommended if there are other drugs that people can't get. So it is used only when other drugs are not accessible or clinically appropriate. There was a new study, however, presented from India with molnupiravir, which actually did show a significant improve, a significant um, um, decrease in hospitalization, uh, greater than the one that was done in the United States, and actually uh, a pretty large study as well. It had a decrease in um, the uh, uh, <clears throat> decrease in hospitalization of over sixty percent, which actually made the drug look a little better. So what we did learn at the end of CROI, uh, of the 29th CROI, was that the 2023 CROI, the one next year, is going to be in Seattle. Hopefully will be a live conference this time. And that I'll just ha have to um, acknowledge my help from getting slides from Trip Gulick, the International Antiviral Society, and others shown on this slide. Thank you very much. If you uh, have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Thanks for the for your attention, Jonathan. Go ahead. Um, on the stem cell injections, have they thought about treating people who do not have leukemia or cancer? Um, yes, there have been probably, to my knowledge, probably about three or four studies that have done that since uh, two thousand and ten. Uh, using stem cells in HIV positive persons, most of whom are on antiretroviral therapy, but who do not have cancer. You know, that the, the challenge with doing that, and I actually was in charge of two of those studies, one done in Australia, one done here in the United States from a small company that I used to work for called Calimune, is that in order to get stem cells to go into the bone marrow, from the, from the blood into the bone marrow, you have to make space in the bone marrow. You have to give a little bit of chemotherapy in order to kill some of the cells that are already there in order for the new cells to be able to have space to go in and do what's called engraft, to become part of the bone marrow. Those studies have not been successful to date um, because giving chemotherapy to make space in persons who don't have cancer does carry some risk. In the studies that I completed, the risk was, um, I'll call it tolerable. Uh, these were all, the one I did, all the persons were outpatients. No one had to end up going to the hospital for any kind of side effects, but we also did not show great results in terms of the stem cells engrafting into the bone marrow and producing HIV negative or HIV resistant cells. So in answer to your question, yes, that is a strategy that has, that has been tried. It will continue to be tried over time. But the hurdle is, is trying to get those HIV resistant stem cells to be able to go into the bone marrow. You know, when you get, when someone has cancer, the main reason they get the high dose chemotherapy and radiation is to destroy the cancer. Because that's what it takes to cure the cancer is destroy the bone marrow and then put in new bone marrow that will, will serve the function that the old bone marrow was using without the cancer, but also put in bone marrow that's resistant to HIV. You know, when you have cancer, you can, you can um, say that wiping out the old bone marrow makes sense, putting in new bone marrow that's HIV resistant is an opportunity. And it's happened a few times, as we talked about, probably three times now. But in someone who doesn't have cancer, wiping out just a bit of their bone marrow, we don't know how much is enough and how much is too much. So that's going to be the challenge we're going to go with. We're going we're, we're to have to try to do more work on it, I'll put it that way. But that's a good question. And just to follow up on that, Dr. Hardy, um, didn't the London patient, Adam Costiejo, 
have a much less um, aggressive um, ablation therapy. And so it's better tolerated. Correct. The uh, London patient did not have radiation. Yeah. Uh, Timothy Brown got radiation uh, because he had leukemia. The patient um, who was treated in New York City also got radiation because she had leukemia. Um, what's different about the London patient is that he had lymphoma. Uh -huh. And lymphoma does not invade the bone marrow as much as leukemia does. And that's oftentimes why more, more um, severe, more stronger uh, bone marrow eradication has to be used for one kind of cancer with leukemia than with another kind like lymphoma. Gotcha. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Gary. Uh, uh, doctor, thank you. Um, with the uh, implantable subcutaneous uh, uh, doses, how do you manage, how, how do, does that dosage last over time? Is there mm. gradually? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the best way to answer that is that there's already a lot of science and actually practical medical experience with using implantable contraceptives. You know, there's a contraceptive that is used widely um, both inside the U.S. and outside the U.S. <coughs> called Norplant, which is a, 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 an implantable hormone that is put in a woman's arm just beneath the skin. You can see it after it's implanted um, and it can last up to a year. It is taken out after a year and a new one is implanted in the other arm because the efficacy about going longer than a year has not been studied or proven. Right now, what has been what is being developed for HIV is something very, very similar to the Norplant or Nexplon. The other product is called Nexplon. And it it has been shown that even up, for the, up to as long as 12 weeks, three months, the level of medication that will come out of the implant into the blood is very adequate, very adequate to be able to suppress and prevent the acquisition of HIV. So all we have so far for implantables is that is latrovir has been given to HIV negative persons for up to as long as 12 weeks or three months. And the levels of the drug that got into the blood were very, very adequate for preventing HIV. And when combined with other medications should probably be enough to, to treat HIV as well. The great thing about implants is this, once the implant is put in, the way that they are constructed is the amount of medication slowly seeps out of it at a very constant rate. And the other good thing about it is, is that if for some reason a problem develops from the medication, it can be removed. The implant can be removed and the level of medication goes away. So that's one of the things that we like about implants is that they are reversible, which could be a good thing. Um, if a side effect develops, unlike what we have available to us now, which so far has not been a problem, but you know, when you inject a medication just beneath the skin or into the muscles of the butt, there's no way you can take it out. So, you know, what I see happening is that we've gotten really good results from our initial long acting HIV treatment and now HIV prevention, long-acting medications. And in fact, the FDA has now even said that that five-week or four-week oral lead-in in which the cabotegravir by itself for prevention or the cabotegravir plus ropivirine, the two components of cabinuva, they, have to be, they used to have to be given orally for four to five weeks just to prove that the person could tolerate the medication 
and not have a bad side effect. The FDA recently said that you don't have to do that anymore if you don't want to, because enough experience has been gained to say that the chances of having a, a bad reaction to the injectable is very, very small. So we're making progress. We're making progress going from short-term oral to injectable. And hopefully, as you know, particularly when Islatovir can be put back into development, right now it's on hold by the FDA, we can start seeing what the implantables can be all about. And it probably won't be the only one. Yeah, more compliance with medication. <laughs> you don't have to do it. Oh, yeah, that would be great. I mean, that's why it's used for birth control. <laughs> you know, and it works. That's why it's used for birth control. Once and you're done for a year. We have another question from uh, Andrew and then from Tim. Uh, yeah, uh, with the uh, vaccines that you showed in the chart, are any of them at the, the newer mRNA vaccines that have been talked about since the advent of COVID? Or are those still in early testing? No, the vaccines I showed there, none of them were mRNA vaccines. Um, as you probably know, the first mRNA vaccine study recently started in, I believe it was in the, at the NIH. And, you know, it's way too early to be able, I mean, the first time it's given, it's usually given to people who have a very low risk of getting HIV, just to see whether or not it's well tolerated. It's given to individuals who, um, who do not have behavior that might expose them to HIV. So the first round of studies with any kind of vaccine is done and people at very low risk. And then if it's shown to be well tolerated, then it will be given to individuals who have increasing amount of risk of exposure to HIV, but only after safety has been confirmed. So yeah, the ones I just showed you had nothing to do with mRNA. They were entirely different uh, platforms for vaccination. Do you have any idea of a timeline of what, when things will be progressing on them? That's a great question. You know, we saw we saw the mRNA vaccines for COVID develop very rapidly from phase one to phase two. To use, they went from phase one to a, what's called a phase two slash three study. And I would imagine that if that can be done for COVID and, and that, that the safety parameters can be met along the way, that it could happen for HIV as well, because it's using the exact same kind of, kind of vaccine. I would anticipate it's going to happen quickly. From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> yeah. Quickly means probably be a year to, you know, probably somewhere between a year to a year and a half. But compared to other vaccine developments, which have taken 10 years, that's incredible. Yeah. One more question. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, this is a uh, COVID and kind of an HIV question. If uh, somebody has COVID and they're prescribed Paxlovid, and they also, mm -hmm. have, and part of Paxlovid is a uh, retonavir, I believe, 100 milligrams. What if the person with HIV is also taking uh, retonavir, like with Resista? Isn't that a great question? <laughs> you know, that's a great question, and I'm and I'm so glad you asked it. You know, you know. First of all, I I, I just want to point out. That the whole reason that Pfizer, who made who makes Paxlovid, is able was able to get that drug to be authorized and probably sometime in not near not the too distant future going to be approved because it is very effective. The whole reason they're able to do that was because HIV identified ritonavir as a good booster. So, you know, here again, HIV science is helping out another area of, of human treatment by, by borrowing from the HIV drug development world of ritonavir boosting and applying it to another drug that it also works well as a booster for. The answer to your question is kind of a tough one. 
You know, we we do know that we can do co-boosting. You know, back when some of the, you know, there were there was a time in the world of HIV that we could boost two different medications with one dose of ritonavir. We did that <clears throat> briefly when we tried to give people two protease inhibitors at the same time and boost them both with one dose of ritonavir because it works. We also tried it when some of the earlier hepatitis C medications required boosting. There was one hepatitis C medication made by Abbott you guys may or may not even remember, it's not used very much anymore, um, that required ritonavir boosting. And if someone had HIV and hepatitis C, there were studies that showed that you could use your ritonavir from one of the drug treatments to boost the other. So that idea of double boosting is not a new one. It's not a new one. Um, the difference is this, is that in HIV, when you're do, double boosting protease inhibitors that are both for HIV, you do it for a lifetime or you do it for a long time. For hepatitis C, because hepatitis C treatment, you know, is now 12, eight to 12 weeks. The, boost, the double boosting doesn't have to occur for very long. And what some people were doing, rather than try to use the ritonavir for both hepatitis C and HIV, is they would put the person on something else for HIV and prioritize the treatment of the hepatitis C because it was only eight to 12 weeks. In this case, the treatment for, for, for COVID is only five days long, you know? The treatment for, with Paxlovid is only five days long. So what I basically have heard is that if someone is on a, a, a ritonavir boosted protease inhibitor like, like Presista, um, possibly like uh, Rayataz, that they are telling them basically keep taking your two drugs as you normally would. Because unfortunately, um, the, well, I should say, fortunately, the, the time that the double boosting may occur is very short. And with treatments, the one thing you don't want to do is to under boost, mm -hmm. because if you under boost or you don't give enough ritonavir they, and you get low levels of the drug that is to be boost, you can get resistance and you can get lack of treat, lack of sufficient treatment. So I know what, what the current recommendations are is that if, if a HIV positive person who is on a boosted protease inhibitor, or God forbid, on a, I just say that because they're no longer used much anymore, but some people still are, I shouldn't say that, God forbid, is on a boosted integrase inhibitor. Because remember, cobacistan is also a booster, very similar to ritonavir. If someone is on a boosted integrase or boosted protease, they just add the five days of Paxlovid as they would normally and keep going. Because the Paxlovid is only gonna be for five days. And that five day period of time is not considered to be enough that you would alter one of the boosters or the other. You know, couldn't you easily find out by doing drug levels of the Paxlovid if uh, the, the single booster would uh, be enough or not? You could, you yeah. could. I, and I imagine, you know, when the FDA approved or when the FDA authorized Paxlovid, I don't believe they even asked that question. Mm. Because what the guidelines, as I remember, say is that, you know, the first thing that any drug company is going to say is don't use it, don't use the two drugs together. Yeah. There's no data. There's no data to direct this. What the guidelines are saying, the um, NIH guidelines for COVID are saying is that right now Paxlovid looks like the most effective drug to use for mild to moderate outpatient COVID because it has a 90% um, decrease in hospitalization rate better than anything else out there. If someone is already on a boosted protease inhibitor or boosted integrase inhibitor and they need Paxlovid, the guidelines are saying just continue on both. 
Yeah. Because you're treating a potentially life-threatening, you know, um, immediately life-threatening illness with the best drug available. And rather than take a chance of under-boosting um, <clears throat> either one of the drugs, you just plow right on through with both. Mm -hmm. And it's only five days. You know, I mean, I guess you could think about... Well, I'm in the research setting, not, not testing it out on patients yeah. in the clinic, but... No, I agree. It's a question I mean, to answer. Yeah, it's one of those. It's one of those, one of those questions in which you you would say this needs to be studied, and who's going to do it, and you know yeah. who's going to take both of these drugs for a period of time to check out, see what's happening. But because of the pandemic, uh, immediately life threatening nature of of COVID nineteen, no one's really looked at that as a as a priority yet. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. We're. Uh... We're past time, but obviously it was a great program and lots of good questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Hardy. We missed seeing you, but uh, it was lovely to hear you. And uh, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks very much for asking me, Jeff. And I, I apologize for not being able to come out. Uh, hopefully in the future that'll change as well. Absolutely. We'll get you back out here again sometime soon.